Good evening and welcome to Open Your Mind Internet Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And myself, Stephen George. Stephen George just having a heart attack because he didn't hear the opening music and he was just getting a I bit concerned. Hear it. I pressed the button when I heard no music. <laughs> It was just another press the button there on this end. Okay, we're going to have a, a packed show, loads of information tonight. So before we go into anything, um, our guest tonight is Brigitte. She's an MP, the member of the Icelandic Parliament. We're going to be bringing in Brigitte in in a few minutes because uh, we've a lot to talk about and she has limited time as well. Okay, so listen, without further ado, we're going to bring Brigitte in because we have a lot, a lot to talk about. So uh, good, day, good evening, Brigitte. How are you? Uh, I'm very good. Thank you for having me on. No problem at all. I'm really, really glad um, you're on. Um, I've been looking forward to this interview when you agreed to come on because, you know, we all heard about how bad Iceland have been through the troubles. And we, 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 I think the general feeling is that they wanted to um, start this experiment with a number of countries around Europe. And whoever, whichever country they used, it would be the template for the other country. So obviously they attacked Iceland first, but Iceland didn't put up with all the shenanigans and what they tried to do. So we know now, we, we do know that they've now come to Ireland to try to do the same in Ireland. But what we want you to do, Brigitte, is um, give us a background of how it all started, why it started, how it happened. And then currently, you know, um, what you're doing and what's happening at the moment. I mean, you have, to, you have the floor there. So um, because we want the Irish people, we want the, our listeners and people of Ireland to listen to what happened in Iceland and what you guys have done to get back up off the ground and fight this, um, these oligarchs, these bankers and international politicians and everything else. So you can take it away from there. All right. Um, so it all happened uh, three years prior to the collapse where the banks, uh, the big banks were privatized. And we found out later through the fact-finding report uh, conducted by the, uh, a special committee by the parliament that they never actually paid for the banks. They just lent each other uh, and made it look like uh, that they were putting some money in it. But there was no money ever put into the large banks that they got basically given. Uh, and these were guys that were associated with the parties. Uh, so one party uh, had one bank and the other party, like the big parties, uh, had the other bank. So in three years' time, the banks, uh, uh, <clears throat> and there was lots of deregulations happening as well. So in three years' time, uh, the banks grew uh, to the size of 10 times our GDP. And when they collapsed in 2008, that was supposed to collapse on us, and which it did. We had the third largest financial meltdown in the history. Uh, and uh, sank from being the most developed country according to the UN standards uh, in 2007 to a status of Zimbabwe or something like that. Wow. And um, so it was a, a humongous shock for the nation because, you know, even there were some voices that were warning about this, that this could not be real. Uh, but most people just bought into, you know, the there was massive... Uh, mortgage uh, bubble and there were, you know, people were taking out loans and foreign currencies and they were basically conned. It, it really, if you want to think about Iceland, you should see the film Enron. And you should think of the guys on the top, but the banksters and the Icelandic politicians and the academia and the media that all failed us. Um, and you should look at the staff on the floor as the Icelandic nation. And the same probably happened in your country and, and all over the Western world now. It already happened in other countries like Asia and, and uh, Latin America earlier. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so we sort of woke up to the reality that everything we trusted had failed us. And that also meant uh, um, that crisis meant an incredible opportunity. Uh, to look at uh, deeper, below the surface, on what went wrong. Uh, and that's what we've been doing. And we have also, one of the first things the government did was actually to create sort of uh, emergency laws, which are often quite negative for nations. But in this instance, uh, it um, created a wall around Iceland uh, and the financial sector in Iceland uh, so that... Uh, the rest of the money could not be sucked out. Uh, 
you know, because, and I and I, I frankly the the I often call this whole financial element uh, spaghetti because you never know where it ends and where it begins. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so like, uh, but the the thing is because it, uh, and this is a big problem in our world, and that is that the financial sector is so interwoven with the political sector by you know them creating the laws in the the financial laws are basically created by lobbyists um from the financial sector yeah then of course they make deliberate holes in in the laws which they know of and then they abuse the laws and we can't stop it before it's too late and i have to say that i don't think that we have done enough in iceland to stop that uh, kind of work uh, and i really think uh, or i'm hoping we're actually working on getting freedom of information act now through the parliament in the next few days and then that we should have access to who writes what part in the laws <laughs> which is critical if you want to stop sort of uh if you don't want things to happen exactly the same in the exact, exactly the same way again okay so if we if we just touch base on that the three main banks in iceland at the time was land banking um, mm -hmm. capping and glitner yeah and they they borrowed apparently and i'm just going by what i've seen on the inside job over a five-year period these banks borrowed 120 billion dollars which is 10 times the uh, gdp of iceland's economy and mm -hmm. um, and i think after that and there was just businessmen obviously the elite who were part of this one businessman i believe went off and he bought um a uh, Manhattan penthouse for 25 million and a pinstripe jet um, a jet that had pinstripes but on he, it. He didn't get the jet, so it was another guy that got the jet. But anyway, that guy uh, who was responsible for Glitner, uh, he still, and at the time he owned the only sort of big uh, privately run media corporation in Iceland. And he still owns it. That's incredible that he's still there. Absolutely. He, what he did, he just uh, gave it to his wives social security number you know yeah that's what these guys did if you look at the spaghetti that they've created by creating endless shells around nothing uh, <clears throat> and getting lots of loans and stuff uh, for the shells uh, it's just fascinating it's a uh, you know it, it, and i really wish the icelandic parliament would uh, translate the fact-finding report because it is fascinating and i really think all um, parliaments and particularly, I encourage the Irish Parliament to do the same, um, because uh, this is so important for uh, being able to deal with uh, the consequences of such uh, scheming uh, and such swindle and such theft from the general public. Yeah, well, I mean, we we don't know. We have the same problem here, that we um, that the, the banks took a gamble, they lost. And uh, as far as I, I know to what I've read and studied is that we are not obliged to pay that money back. And they keep going to talking about the sovereign debt, the sovereign debt. Well, no, there is a debt of money that we owe, probably got, we got a loan of, but not the money. I mean, banks are privately owned. So okay. if, if, if my business or the chap down the road who has a business, if that goes down, if that goes down, down the pan and he loses his business, does that mean that... He, you know, the taxpayer will come and bail him out. No, they won't. So the banks are privately owned. And one of the things they also said in Iceland is that when the banks did collapse at the end of 2008, unemployment tripled in six mm -hmm. months. Yeah. So and, and, and I mean, prior to that, we had next to no unemployment. We had like 2% unemployment or something like that. So we are not used to dealing with the problems that you get when people are unemployed for long periods of time. Yeah. Uh, and and we're still, you know, we are just still in the eye of the storm. Uh, even if we've managed to minimize the damage by our actions, we are. It's it's a long way to go before we manage to get out of this recession, uh, and uh, and the shock, uh, the after effects, uh, and um, and we're still dealing with uh, uh, the EFTA court because uh, they they want us to pay ISAF. Okay. And so even if we manage to stop it, the nation managed to stop this, and, and even if it's obvious that uh, now the bank is actually Landsbanki, which is responsible for this, uh, for ISAF, it looks like the assets of it will cover uh, the entire debt. 
but still they're going after us. And it was actually, actually extraordinary to see how both the UK and Holland abused their positions in the EU on an ECOFIN meeting to uh, blackmail the Icelandic financial minister at the time to accept to take on ISAFE to write on a mem memorandum um, or IU, I, IOU <clears throat> uh, that he would, that, you know, that he, Iceland would do it or there would be no IMF loan and because all the nations had said to Iceland you're not going to get any support unless you go into the IMF program uh, it was the guy was not left with any choice well we have a couple, couple, couple of questions there but one of them is let's just clarify what the ISAVE was and you can you can correct me if I'm wrong right what people were doing is in in the UK and Dutch in the Netherlands they were putting money into this ISAVE account um, mm -hmm. in the lands lands banking which meant that increased the liquidity of the bank they, they had more funds uh, but one of the things that came with that was that there was a high interest rate of return now mm -hmm. if anybody in finance understands when you put into something that's high you get high interest rate it means there's higher risk and that's the way it works lower interest means lower risk higher interest means higher risk so what happened was that all these savers from the uk and the netherlands put all their money in this i save and then the banks collapsed and then the instead of the saver saying well it was a high risk account so there's nothing i can do about that what they what happened was they came back and said oi we've lost our money we know it's a high risk account but we still want their money back and this yeah. is why do you can to pay it <laughs> then, yeah you had to pay it and what you're saying is in iceland was saying well hang on a minute it was a high risk account you knew there's a high risk in it so you know the banks collapsed because of their greed they were de deregulated, which meant they just took a loan of billions of 120 billion, which they shouldn't have done. And um, and that's why they... Let's not forget one thing, which is very important <clears throat> in this, and that is that uh, the factor of the, the rating companies, Iceland and these banks was rated triple A just before everything collapsed. Yeah, and they were rated, I believe or not, KPMG in America said, yeah. oh, there's no problem here. Exactly. KPMG, who's an auditor, they looked at the books and thought, yeah, there's no problem here. I mean, it's unbelievable, and I have to say that the Icelandic banksters were not that sophisticated that they could have been able to uh, make this up without experts being able to see it, and if so, then these rating companies should actually just fold. Well, we have the same problem here. We had, our regulators were asleep at the way wheel here. But we know we know they weren't asleep. We know they just paid off or part of the, the, the golden circle, as we call it over here. The, mm -hmm. the, uh, we have a handful of people involved in this golden circle where it is all brown envelopes or whatever going on. I'm sure there's something like that going on anyway. Or pats on the back or favours going on. And we, the regulator just let the banks do what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the 90s, we had the Celtic Tiger. We got all this money from uh, the IMF. I mean, this is, this, you know yourself, this is the trick. They get loads of money from the IMF. We spend the money, and then the IMF says, "Give us our, give us the money back." And then the country goes, "Can't afford it." And then the IMF say, "Okay, let's see what assets you have, and let's see, let's exactly. what natural resources." Yeah, yeah. This it's is a, it's the same. They have not changed a bit, and and actually, it's very important that people understand what sort of danger you are in. You're in exactly the same danger as we are, and that is um, uh, if you don't have strong laws that protect your natural assets, the things that should be, remain in the custody of the nation and in the guardianship and ownership of the nation. Uh, that has to be ensured that no rich sort of multi-corporation can go and suck it away from you uh, at payday. And uh, they've already started here. One of our energy companies uh, was bought up uh, by... Um, a company called Magma Energy. Uh, they are a front, and they actually created a, a, like a drawer company in Sweden. They are a front for Pan American Silver Corporation, which is one of these notorious mining corporations in Canada. Mm. Uh, and and you know the government wanted to buy it, but the IMF said you can't. Uh, and now it's no longer in the ownership or guardianship of the nation. Uh, and this is exactly what will happen. And the, uh, another thing which will happen, and that is your politicians will say, the IMF is forcing us to do this. What I found out after many meetings, both with the government and the IMF, is that um, 
nobody forced them to cut down so much in the health and education. They were just doing what they didn't fight for us. They did not fight for us, like many countries do. Uh, you know, like they really tried, there's some politicians in Jamaica that really did try to put up a fight. Yeah. Uh, 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 but still, you know, the IMF destroyed the agriculture, uh, uh, like in the ancient way of doing agriculture in, in Jamaica, and it's now all import, they even import milk powder from the United States instead of having cows. <laughs> you know, and they used to have just like a few cows for each farmer, and it's all ruined. That, that's incredible. I mean, we, we're the same over yeah. here. We, yes, you know, yeah. so you, you cannot be lazy, you know, people have to go and fight this now. The, you um, should not be worrying about like petty things, you know, um, about if you don't agree slightly on something. You have to figure out that you have a real threat and it's now in your do in your home, in your country. Well, I, th I think there's a, there's a bit of apathy over here, as I said, um, and it's a kind of I'm okay, Jack, as long as I'm okay. But what people don't realise is it will affect everybody. Now, I believe that the Icelandic people, you had a referendum, and 70 to 80% of the people um, voted to say, no, we're not going to pay the IMF or the UK or the Dutch the money back. Yeah. Because you knew that that, was, that would devastate the country. Exactly, and I mean, we did. It was a lot. It was a humongous fight in the parliament, uh, and I was just newly elected when I got all these, these incredible battles. Uh, and it was uh, uh, we managed to get so much information out that was supposed to be secret. Actually, the financial minister was going to have the parliament process the first contract without the parliament seeing it, and then somebody leaked it. Uh, thank God, some some leaked the Dutch part of it. Uh, so they were forced to show it to us. Uh, but, you know, it's been a fight every step of the way. And, and what we did, which is important, is that uh, we calculated how much of the income tax would go into only paying of the interest. And mm. when people saw that, that it would be absolutely unsustainable, that uh, we could just as well fold. Uh, then they then they rose up and, and demanded to uh, have a national referendum and... Uh, but this was, you know, lots of people put effort into this. Um, but we're only 318,000, uh, and yet we managed to get enough activists uh, and people concerned to do stuff. And you are, there are a lot more Irishmen than Icelanders. So I'm sure that you just have to figure out the way to deal with, to get the, to use your system for the benefit of the people. And you have to apply nearly the same, um, creativity as a hacker that hacks into the real system and finds the weaknesses for the people uh, and makes the people aware of it. We figured that if we would direct the national referendum to the Icelandic president, because uh, he has to sign every law in Iceland uh, before it becomes law. So we directed the referendum uh, plea to him. Mm. And he is supposed to listen and act if there is a uh, um, a, a huge uh, uh, gap between the nation and the parliament. So we had to listen. And that's how we got, got it through. Um, so I'm sure there are ways in Ireland where you can actually um, push uh, for the necessary uh, protections for Ireland through the people power. Well, what we have to try and do, Brigitte, is to find, an, uh, find a TD. We call them TDs over here. Find an honest TD. Find a TD that will actually do this and help us and have somebody on the inside. But to be honest with you, I don't know of any honest TDs. So if there is a TD, out, an Irish TD out there who wants to come on the show and say that he's for the people, please come on. Because I really don't know. I mean, when it comes to voting over here, we had um, the uh, at the beginning of the year, we had the general election. And the old party went out and the new party came in. And um, to be honest with you, you know, who do you vote for? There was one party we had a preference to. But, you know, again, it's a party. And they're probably towing the line to, to, the certain, to a certain extent as well. So mm -hmm. um, th this is the problem. Now, tell me something. I heard a rumour, and I don't know how true this is. The fact that the IMF threatened not to give you any money. Did Russia happen to step in somewhere and give you money at, at, at a lower rate of interest? 
Uh, no, but there, there were some speculations that there would be that there were some mm. offers in the pipeline. Mm. Uh, but I don't think that interfered in uh, what I really think interfered the most with the IMF process was the you know the UK and Dutch applying their power within it because they are quite big um, and uh, and they also used the leverage they have in the EU to do the same mm. so I, I think but one of the things that many people are not aware of uh, but that our friends um, in the uh, in the U in the UK decided to apply a terrorist act on Iceland um, so basically on Landsbanki, but they put it on the website um, of the financial webpage or something. Uh, I some ha somewhere I have a, a screenshot of it, uh, where Iceland was on the list of uh, nations um, that, you know, such as Zimbabwe, North Korea, organizations such as Al-Qaeda uh, and Cuba uh, for a freeze. Like <laughs> Yeah, I heard about this. You were you were tra they treated like a terrorist. Yeah. So so what happened was that companies in Iceland that had been doing trading uh, with the UK and other countries in Europe for decades without any problems, all of a sudden could not uh, have any insurances. So we were looking into uh, so, so they couldn't trade. I mean, we were in a, like every other nation in cash shortage, uh, so they couldn't fork up uh, huge amounts of prepayments um, for the insurances. So we were actually being faced with food and medical shortages. Three weeks, uh, I believe, yeah? Yeah, so yeah. if we would not have caved in to the threats uh, from the UK and the Dutch, um, with the first agreement to say uh, a memorandum of understanding, uh, we would have been dealing with that sort of scenario. And um, so we are very vulnerable. So we rely on uh, good relations with uh, our friends. But I think one of the key elements that we need to do for the future, uh, all nations, is that we have to, if we want to have any planet left, we have to become much more self-sustainable. And uh, we can't uh, carry on living the way we're living. Uh, we have to make real changes in our own lives as well mm. and we can expect others to always take all responsibility we also have to take responsibility on our own societies and and the consequences of the apathy is the problems we're dealing with today mm. and we so, we have that in a big i mean we have you know i'm not saying it's 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 completely down to fluoridated water but we do have our water fluoridated so not only do we have a lot of apathy in the country we have people are being poisoned by the fluoride in the water. Um, and, you know, again, as I say, going to the, trying to find politicians that actually want to do something is going to be the hard bit. Now, you, Iceland, I believe, was three weeks away from not having food, and you were close to a collapse. And I believe you had something like 5,000 people march on the presidential palace or the presidential building to actually demand that something be done. Um, I don't remember that one because uh, the president in Iceland, uh, it's important to note that he doesn't have much power. Mm. The only power he has is to refuse to sign a law um, if it's obvious that there is a gap between this, uh, the, the nation and the parliament. Mm. Uh, but usually people would vote, uh, go and protest uh, outside the parliament uh, or outside the offices of the prime minister. Um, so it's probably you're probably referring to protest um, in that regard, but we did have a revolution in Iceland. Yeah, well, that's the revolution, uh, and the other the it, was, it was more than five thousand. I tell you, this was lasted for days, and we had we first just started with there were these small protests uh, uh, here and there, and then mm -hmm. one guy started to uh, organize to have protests uh, every Saturday. Um, and more and more people started to show up. We had big marches uh, uh, and um, and all sorts of civic meetings, open meetings where uh, uh, the people, the parliamentarians and the leaders of the parties were uh, sort of forced to come and speak to the people. <laughs> uh, and, and in the end, you know, it was obvious that the government was not listening to the demands to kick out the... Uh, 
the central bank manager mm. uh, and to fire the guy that was over the financial regulator, the regu regulatory uh, uh, administration. And uh, so the government was kicked out, basically. Well, that's that's what really we. I mean, imagine that, Steve. Imagine TDs coming down and speaking to the common man in the street over here. That would be a, that would be a miracle, wouldn't it? It'd be one for the books anyway. I, I I couldn't imagine that happening. How are the house for all the like the you know the 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 metal work and all the gates and the security for them to come out and actually speak to the people? That would be a shock. Now the other rumor we heard, Brigitte, was that some bankers and I won't say politicians, but some bankers were sent to jail in Iceland. Is that true or false? Uh, unfortunately, that's false. There's one guy being sentenced. Uh, he has appealed. Uh, he was the sort of head uh, of staff in one of the ministries, uh, and he's been found, found guilty of, um, um, you know, using knowledge that he had in advance about the collapse to sell stocks. Um, uh, but uh, there is um, uh, investigations into this whole thing still ongoing mm. and because it's such a spaghetti <laughs> it's very hard to pin them down because mm. they know how to abuse the law that's why you know at times like this i think that you know it's i really don't think that the um people that have created and are now abusing the law should uh, be protected by these laws yeah uh, i think that they should just be you know uh made exile from the Icelandic uh, to be able to uh, invest in Iceland. I don't necessarily want them in prison. I don't want to pay for their food. We've paid enough for them. Mm. I just don't want them to invest, ever to be able to invest again. Yeah, and, no and, and, and stop it there. Um, one of the things um, I was going to talk to you about um, the private debt, but what I'll do, we have a question come in there. So we'll go over to the question on the site there, Steve. Yeah, Brigitte, we have a question uh, from Dan and Michelle. And Dan and Michelle are wondering, is it true that the British government is taking or are taking Iceland to court to try and get the money back? Yes, it's true. Uh, through uh, EFTA. Uh, and um, we'll see what will happen uh, because just last week we got news that uh, there's going to be 100% uh, recovery of the money. Uh, that they actually what they did which is so interesting so uh, you have to remember what was happening in the politics in the UK at the time so you had Gordon Brown and, and Darling and uh, they were faced with incredible criticism uh, in the UK for how they had been dealing with uh, the crisis mm. and they decided to actually go and punch us a bit because we're easy to punch we don't have any military and you know we're not the real threat yeah uh, and so they wanted to show how big and mighty they were. And they were basically the contract they offered us for money that we never agreed we, to, to uh, pay out because it's not our responsibility. Uh, <laughs> it was just so incredible, that contract. It was just like reading a colonist nation telling their colony what to do. That's, That's what it felt to us. That's incredible. And, yeah. And the same, I mean, of course, you looked at the history of colonization of both Holland and the UK, and you understand why they behave this way. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I have to stress, you know, I have many, many good friends in both Holland and in the UK, and I'm by no means uh, I'm directing, directing my frustration at the people there. Uh, because I've always said I don't want the UK taxpayers nor the Dutch taxpayers to pay for this. I want the people that are responsible for stealing this money to pay for it. And, you know, I would be happy to uh, uh, do everything to help recover the assets. And that's what we've done. Uh, and if there is anything left over, you know, then I think actually the private jet of one of the guys is still on sale. <laughs> so, you know, take that and, you know, it's worth a lot. And, you know, but uh, and and he's actually investing in Iceland, which is uh, also very disturbing to me in a in a data farm. I look, but uh, yeah, it's, I think it's so disturbing. I mean, it's like um, I don't know where to start when I think about these things. But I have to say again, and I have to stress that the only way we can change it is to for us to go into the belly of the beast, mm. to go into places of power, 
and change it both from within and from outside. And we have to change the law so people can actually claim back their power. And and tell us how you did that. Tell us before we did before we um, we went live. You were telling us how you did that about the different groups. So just okay. go through that again, Brigitte. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> and also my background is uh, I've been an activist for a long time for various causes, everything from uh, fighting against the Iraqi war to uh, helping uh, Tibet. Uh, and uh, environmental issues and so forth. Uh, and um, so I was automatically sort of, because I'd been organizing so many protests uh, for uh, Tibet prior to the collapse, uh, I organized protests every week outside the Chinese embassy for nine months. Um, I was asked by the people to help organize a big event that they were trying to pull together all the different grassroots groups that had uh, emerged uh, to the delight of us that they have been active for a long time, that they were actually new people. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and so we tried to get these different groups to start to work together. And the first event we did was a big uh, joint protest. And then we had uh, some other meetings. Uh, and I remember the most critical meeting for this was uh, mid-December. Uh, where we ask these different groups, what are the three most important things that we need to do in order to prevent another collapse like this? And um, every one of them said, uh, and we had them write on notes, uh, and and on every note there was um, that we needed to create a political moment to go into parliament to change things from in, within as well. Mm. Because we'd been knocking on the doors on, on the outside and nobody was opening the doors at all. Um, and we wanted to create some sort of bridge between the general public and the parliament. Uh, and, and thus uh, we started the process of figuring out what we had in common, uh, what we felt were the most urgent things to do. Uh, and we created something called Solitary uh, Coalition of the Grassroots Movement. And uh, we decided not to define ourselves left or right, to have no leaders, but horizontal structure, mm. uh, to have uh, that sort of a checklist, an agenda that was not political. So, for example, Iceland is now applying for the EU. We decided not to put that in as one of our targets, but to put in that the nation was obliged to vote for it, um, uh, if it wanted to join or not. Uh, and we were very much focused on like that the IMF would not have uh, control over state budget, uh, severing the ties between the corporate and the state, um, and of course democratic reform, and to do something uh, um, for the homes in Iceland that had suffered tremendously from uh, the financial collapse because their mortgages Uh, skyrocketed uh, and and there are so many people losing their homes uh, and have lost all their savings. Well we we have that now in Ireland we have I think I said on the show last week that I have a a friend who um, who was I was talking to during the week and um, she basically has two days of uh, food left Um, now hopefully she's sorted out a bit more now but at the time when I spoke to her she had two days of food for herself and a child and this no, is this no. is uh, this terrible. It's a twenty fourth century in Ireland, and yeah. this should not be going on. And it's because of an elite, corrupt international bankers, politicians screwing the system, and just well, not giving a damn about anybody. I mean, it's just pure greed and selfishness that's going on. And Ireland's no different. The war. I mean, we're going through it. We have, you know, taxes after tax after tax. There's there's people losing the house left, right, and centre. And we have two new um, uh, laws coming in, if you want to call them that, water rates. So we're going to pay to kill ourselves now. And property tax, a flat rate and property tax. Like, like in the UK, they have the property tax over there. And it's just, um, it's just gone beyond a joke. It really is. And we, we, like, like yourself, we need to do something over here in Ireland. We need something to happen. We need to get together. We need to get all these truth movement groups to focus on the common purpose. And to get this corporatocracy away, get the, the corporate companies away from the actual government and get the government to realize that they work for us, that we don't work for them. Yeah, and it, it's very, it's, this is so true and it is so important to um, not hang yourselves on anything like the teabaggers or the left and right 
uh, but to find your own uh, path. And uh, you can learn from others, but you have to find your own path. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll be happy to provide you with any further information if you want to know how we did it. But we, in eight weeks, we managed to get 7% of the vote and we didn't have any money. Uh, and if the time would have been a bit better, I mean, like the best party in Iceland uh, won the city with 30% uh, of the vote because the time it was just after the report. <laughs> so uh, um, I think I, I really just really feel that we're at such critical time right now that uh, it's so important to act uh, and just to um, lay aside all these small details and focus on the big picture together and get, get, uh, get back to normal now yeah. I, be I believe the actual credit rating in iceland has now got to a level because i know the businesses in europe have a very very short memory because they like making money so the credit rating in iceland has gone to an acceptable level where th where they'll do business in ireland we're at junk rating so i think you're you're on the up and up now at least you're you're on you're on the way up the hill mm -hmm. yeah we we are we are sort of scraping the bottom right now uh, but we're still suffering in the sense that there are so many people that don't get enough uh, money for food we never had this uh, uh, we had very few people that had to go and get food handouts and stuff like that um, and um, and there are so many people leaving I'm, I'm the most worried about that um, and they will carry on uh, cutting down uh, slashing down even if the IMF is sort of uh, officially left, they haven't really left because we still owe the the loan. We still owe them the money. Mm. Uh, um, and um, but one thing I think we could also do, and I've been discussing this with people in Greece and Spain and uh, um, other countries, is that those of us that are either sort of in an IMF program have been in an IMF program or are heading into one, mm. we should have like a World Debt Forum um, where we uh, learn from, for example, Argentina and Ecuador and Bolivia. Uh, there's much to learn from uh, Latin America. Now, you, you, you have your own currency in Iceland. You're, yeah. not, you're not in the euro. And of course, we are. And that's the problem over here. Now, we believe, we've been told... Um, two people uh, and a, a, a guest we had on who's an investigative journalist saying that the Irish Central Bank is actually still printing the Irish punt um, w whether it's obviously the printing on the license now if they're printing it because they're concerned about the euro or they're printing it because they have to print it it doesn't really matter at least they're printing it and we know that if there is a catastrophe and we're all on the same tightrope and that tightrope breaks that we can actually run out and well the bank will issue the punt and and but that's the great thing with iceland and that's the tricky thing with ireland is that we are in the euro we don't have our own currency you still you guys still do well the icelandic uh, currency also creates a lot of problems for people in iceland because um because we have the krona um there is a special system in place which is sort of um uh it's hard to explain uh because it's so weird but let's say you get a mortgage and your mortgage is attached to a, um, what do you call it, uh, like an index? So like, like a tracker. Time, a tracker? I'm not sure what it's called. It's like uh, every time petrol goes up, your mortgage goes up. Okay, well, I, I heard this and maybe this will explain it in Iceland. Um, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like index linked, so with yeah, the, with the economy. Index linked to the prices of goods. <laughs> okay, so if you... Uh, it's crazy because uh, what do governments do when um, they're in a financial crisis? They raise the taxes on petrol, alcohol, uh, and cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, and oil. And so, and you're struggling to pay a mortgage. Your salary is not um, going up and has not been going up. You can't get extra jobs uh, and... Uh, your mortgage is actually mutated into instead of paying a thousand euros a month, you're paying three thousand. Um, it's just impossible, and uh, and this it's called uh, this is one of the big battles, and we're probably going to have to um, have to look, look. Well, we are looking into having another currency because the Icelandic krona is good right now, um, but 
you know, during, and that's because we have actually currency restrictions. Mm. So there is a fixed rate on the Atlantic Krona. Okay. And as soon as that's lifted, it's sort of frozen. So for example, uh, if I go abroad, I can only, I can only buy foreign currency if I have a ticket to, let's say, Ireland or the UK or something. Um, and I can only buy a certain amount of currency and that's okay. And, and when I'm back to Iceland, I actually have to return the currency I don't use. Yeah. That's how bad it is. So can you imagine if you're in trade? God, that's terrible. Yes. So there's lots of things that people don't know because you see so many, we're so different uh, system than you have uh, because of how small we are. Um, and like I said, there is a big battle ahead. We are still, you know, um, dealing with laws that are extremely unfair to people that uh, uh, own property in Iceland. 85% of people own their own property. Don't you just want to grab these politicians and shake them and go, you know, <laughs> cop on, let's get this sorted. Now, there's a couple of questions for you that's come in over the state. Brigitte, a couple more questions have come in. I'll just, I'll just throw them all at you and let you answer them in, in whatever order uh, that, that okay. you choose. Um, ask Brigitte, please ask Brigitte if the cost of living has increased uh, since this happened. Also, I think uh, you've, you've, you may have answered this one. Is it true that the mortgage have been renegotiated and made smaller and therefore manageable, unlike Ireland? And the most important question of the evening, how much is a pint of beer in Iceland? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I have to admit that um I don't know what the Icelandic uh, krona is. Is it? Do you, you have euro? Yeah. yeah. So euro is like 160. Um, let me think. Uh, point of beer. What, this is a very is important that? question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I usually don't buy beer when I go out. Uh, I think it's about a, a thousand Icelandic krona, which is um, uh, maybe five euros or something like that five six euros yeah that would be about, about yeah. the same here yeah. yeah we did hear we did hear iceland is it can be expensive it is uh, but it actually after the collapse of the corona um which collapsed by half <laughs> so every time i go to and use a euro it's twice as expensive for me as an icelander as it was prior to the collapse well, so every time i buy a euro to get half less uh, or other currencies well, we, we heard one of the things, the other thing that we heard about Iceland, and maybe you can clarify this for us, is that your system um, is set up in a way that if a if somebody buys a house, say, for 300000 and their mortgage is £1,000 a month, and then because it's tracked or index, index linked, if that goes down, then the repayments, because the value of the house has gone down, the repayments go down also. Um. Does that make sense? There are many uh, programs right now that the government has put in place to try to uh, uh, deal with um, these mutated loans. Uh, and most of them have only worked for people that were actually overspending. Mm. You know what I mean? That had too many loans uh, and would never have been able to pay them unless nothing would change or took too many risks. Uh, the people that were sort of res responsible uh, and actually laid down lots of money as the down payment for their mortgages, they are losing that, all of it. Uh, and they are not getting any um, governmental help because they are not in deep enough shit. <laughs> okay, uh, are that, so. <laughs> that's okay. Are there repossessions going on at the moment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a lot. Uh, and it's uh, I don't see if, you know, I don't see that it's going to get uh, any better soon. Um, and I don't have accurate, no, I, I heard that there are like 300 um, properties going up on auction. Um, and I don't know how many of them are actually uh, actual homes or if any of those belong to uh, uh, somebody that was building. Okay, so uh, yeah, like but, a developer or something. Yeah, yeah but I, the... The thing is, which is so shocking, is that the banks uh, were lending like a hundred percent loans, which is insane. That's I mean, the... just insane, and that the government would allow it—that's even more insane. But I'm, uh, 
But you had a referendum saying you don't want to pay the money back. So, right. sh- so surely but, that, you but know. It's only ISAF. I mean, that, and ISAF was big, but there are other things that collapsed. This was, remember, the third largest financial meltdown in the history of humankind. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> even if we put uh, relatively good shields for us, uh, we are still, you know, have massive consequences to deal with. Um, and it, they have, would have been much worse if we were not, like, because I don't know if people are aware of, like, with ISAF and why it was such a big deal, was that there were, like, 300 and something thousand ISAF accounts. And if we would have agreed to what the Dutch and the British want us, wanted us to do, then each person, be it my children or my grandmother uh, or myself, would have been uh, accountable for 20,000 euros. But the, that's the way it is over here at the moment. We're paying... You have to stop it. You have to stop it. it our, our children and our children's children are going to be liable for this unbelievable debt that we can't pay off because the banks gambled and they lost. And it's just... It's, it's you know, the people who are working are paying taxes. So they, they're, they're, they're getting less money because of all this tax going to the government the government gives it to the bank then the bank comes around and says oh you're not you can't pay your mortgage so we're going to take the house off you and we're saying hang on a minute i can't pay the mortgage because i'm paying you guys and what are the what are they doing now as well i don't know if, if brigitte is aware of this but uh, the, the banks over here now after they repossess your house they don't want to see people homeless so they're now giving you the option to rent the house back yeah, from they're the doing bank it in iceland too it's absolutely outrageous and it, it is so absolutely insane. That's mad. Why? why do you, I can't understand why these politicians are not looking at this and saying the same thing. I mean, you don't have to be Einstein to look at this to see how ridiculous it is. I know. And, and, and I don't know how it's in Ireland, but in Iceland, uh, if you, um, if you like, go bankrupt, they can revolt. I mean, even if you lose your house and it goes on auction, then you still owe the money that like and they always auction it really cheap. Yeah, that, you still owe the the in between. Yeah, so that, say auction the house for like thirty thousand and it, the debt is sixty thousand. You are still res- you've lost your home and you're still responsible for thirty thousand. Yeah, that that's Same. the difference. In America, you can give them back the keys and then walk Same. away. Yeah. But over We've been here, oh, for this uh, bill, the the key bill, like we call it, uh, uh, and with one of the former members of one of the left greens parties in Iceland uh, uh, wrote the bill and we've been lobbying and lobbying and lobbying to try to support her to just finalize it and and it's not happened yet and it's two and a half years since we had the so-called left-wing government that was supposed to put a shield around the homes that Mm. was the promises and they've basically just created a shield we call it like the tent shield yeah (laughs) They created a shield around the uh, um, around the the corporate sector. Well, I think I think as an MP, Brigitte, I think you need to go in there and go up and shake them a bit, and give them a shake and go, wake up! Do you see what's going on? Now I tell you, we have a few minutes because obviously we're watching the time. We know that you have limited time. Now, can you give us some, you know, hindsight or some wisdom from Iceland, and you know, give it to the Irish people to say. This is what you need to do, guys. Well, uh, I think, uh, I, like, first of all, I want to say that uh, uh, the Icelanders are half Irish genetically. Um, if you look at our genealogical makeup uh, and half Norwegian. And so we see ourselves as pretty much Irish in many ways. And I know that the Irish people have strong spirit uh, and that they can, uh, they have to fight this. I mean, you had your terrible times where your language was stolen from you and uh, you were treated like dirt by a certain nation. Mm. And it's really only up to you, my dear Irish friends, to stand up and, and, and make the real change to to know that you each one of you that are listening to this please remember that you as an individual have the power to change the world Mm. you know nobody's gonna do it for you but find like-minded people and and you know to start we 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 need to have a collective we need to have 
um, it, it, it defined the lowest common denominator, the thing that we all agree on. Because I yeah. know there's infighting, but we all have to put that aside and say, look, with the countries in the state, we need to get together and have like five bullet points of things that we all agree on and need to be done and then do them. I have an assembly, have like a, a meeting where you actually also uh, invite other groups. Just, you know, try to find that common ground uh, so that you have as many groups as possible only focusing on these things. Uh, you know, these five or ten, probably ten things. And then everything else, you're just free to have your opinion about it. You don't have to discuss it at these assemblies. Uh, and then what you need to do, and which is really helpful, is to go to different communities and have, like, uh, you know, free documentary nights. Go and speak to people. That's what the, uh, I saw this beautiful documentary called Flow, for the love of water, about the privatization of water. And what struck me was... Um, one very powerful thing from an old man he used to be in the Gandhi movement and he said uh, the power is in our legs right the power of okay in our legs. so you have to go and walk out and do those old-fashioned things as well even if we can use the internet uh, to to bring people together and he also said one of my favorite quotes uh, which is the tw 21st century will be the century of the common people mm. And I believe that. Well, I hope that's the case. Um, we did have, in this year, earlier this year, we had a march of over 100,000 people. Unfortunately, I don't know about Iceland, but our media over here is, um, they are kowtowing to um, the government. They are the propaganda yeah. wing of the government. Of course, they get their money. I mean, can you think about how much money the political parties put into advertising with the media? Yeah. Exactly. It's a problem. I mean, it's like this problem of the corporate and the state that needs to be severed. Yeah, we need to we need to break that away. And over here, it's the same thing. So, trying to get the information out. As I say, when we were doing the Lisbon Treaty, we lost our democracy in Ireland with yeah. the Lisbon Treaty because the first time that we had it, we voted no. That was the answer. No, thank you. End the story. And of course, the government said, oh, well, you know, well, you you better say it, Steve. You're better off explaining it than I am." What do you normally say with the Lisbon Treaty? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you didn't quite understand that, so we're going to Well, that's what they again. say. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we voted it's, on it, and then our government said, well, do you know what, you, 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 didn't, you, you didn't understand it, so do you know what, listen, listen, we, we'll do it again. And this <laughs> time, you know, don't vote the same way as you did the last time, because that was, that was the wrong way, so just do it again. Hmm. While I have the microphone, Go on. Um, uh, Brigitte, one of, our, one of our listeners has just sent in... Uh, a comment and he wants to know would you consider moving to ireland to live here and set us all free and you can stay in his house he says <laughs> <laughs> there you go you get your first yeah. invite so if the, right, if the right wing party get in in iceland we'll send you over a ticket yeah yeah so uh if they win i'll leave iceland uh, and um i think I, th I, I just you know if we could do it you guys can do it and just, yeah. just, Brigitte, just let people know again. I mean, we have a population here. I think it's about 4.2 million. How many? What's the population again of Iceland? 317,000. 317,000 people. And if they can make a, di a difference, well, then I think we can certainly make a difference. Well, like Iceland, you see, we don't. Uh, we probably, I don't know whether they have postcodes in Iceland, but we don't because we're all pretty friendly and know each other. That's why, that's when I have people ring up from the UK. And they say to me, what, what's the postcode? What's your postcode? And I said, no, we don't have postcodes. We're all friendly. We all know each other. You know, because <laughs> guaranteed you go to the pub and say, yeah, oh, yeah, you're Irish. Do you know such and such? Yeah, you know, and I go, yeah, yeah, I used to drink with his sister all the time. Um, yeah. But no, that's what that's we need that's to. The, that's the beauty of it. It's both difficult and it's also very powerful. Hmm. So um, you just need to get strong um, mandate by putting together some important points that you all feel very important in order to uh, bring an alternative to a system that's only serving itself. And I think one of the, the big important issues are to give people access to power by being able to call for not only national referendums, but also to sack the government if they are working against the people. Um, and. Um, and you need to maybe look at your constitution 
that's the stuff that we're doing right now. We are uh, we we task people that the nation voted for to rewrite our constitution, and uh, um, I think that is an important process to do at times of crisis. That nations understand what sort of society they want to live in. I think you have to be very very careful with that, especially the people who are writing that because the wording, the legalese that could be used to change it and a word can mean so many different things well that's why you have um uh you have what they did here was that they had um they crowdsourced it so they put it on the internet each suggestion and they had people gave people access to uh write in amendments uh or suggest if something was missing uh but they were actually appointed by the parliament to do this but they were not chosen by the parliament. They were chosen by the people. Yeah. See, that's brilliant. Imagine yeah. that. You know, having the people have, letting the people have their say instead of being controlled by a group of dopey politicians in a doll who haven't a clue what they're doing and they're just sitting there counting their money with the brown envelopes that they're getting. Um, transparency is the key, really. Allegedly, transparency. Yes, yeah. you have to have uh, also strong uh, Freedom of Information Act that they follow. Uh, and uh, you have to also which uh, is very important, is you should not have politicians to be privileged in any way. So in Iceland, we get relatively low salary as uh, parliamentarians, and I don't have any privileges. I don't even have staff, which is very bad. Uh, you know, I would like to have one assistant, uh, but, uh, you know, I'd rather have even that salary um, just uh, to have somebody help me out. But I don't have any privileges except, you know, I have a parking space uh, outside the parliament. Well, would you believe, uh, Brigitte, Air Taoiseach is paid more money than Barack Obama? Really? Yeah. Yep. Uh, air politicians... <laughs> we, we, we had one of our local politicians was in one of our local papers, and he said he's, he found it hard struggling on €120,000 a year. Uh, you, it's time you guys take over, you know. It's time that... Um, and that you reclaim your democracy because uh, and this is one thing i've noticed the more i've been lo looking at democracy it's it's an illusion it's dead uh we don't have democracies we have dictatorship with many heads yeah yeah def definitely i totally agree yeah, democracy is gone and democracy left well it's probably gone before the lisbon treaty but it's definitely gone now anyway Brigitte, I know you are limited with your time and, you know, if you could do another hour, I'd love to, but I know you have to go off and do what you have to do. So um, I'd just like to say uh, I really enjoyed the interview and finding out what's going on in Iceland and obviously the, the information that you've given us to tell the Irish people to get up and get organised and stop putting up all this kind of crap that we're getting from our politicians and paying high salaries for them doing nothing and putting the country in an awful state. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Steve and Steve will do his normal roundup at the end. Okay, Brigitte, I'd like to echo everything that Alan has uh, has said and uh, really, really, we both really appreciate you coming on, taking time out of your day and, and doing this to, to, to help the, us and, and educate the people. But uh, Brigitte, normally at the end of, it, of each interview, we always ask the guests, do you have a website or a book or a DVD or anything where people can can go to maybe do some more research and maybe if you could just, I don't know a couple of websites anything to to point people in a direction where they can get more information on on what you and what Iceland uh, have done. Right. Uh, so uh, I want to first of all I want to express my gratitude uh, and I have been waiting for having an opportunity to uh, you know have a direct communication with uh, my fellow Irish people. Uh, which I feel a strong connection with. Um, and um, I want to thank you guys for what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to be on your show again sometime in the future. Um, and I want to direct people to see a very important film called Deptocracy, uh, as in death. Uh, and it's from Greece. Um, if you want to see more of what I've been up to, you can Google my name uh, and you can find lots of my speeches and stuff on YouTube. Uh, and they're all in English. Uh, the website I would like to direct you to is uh, immi.is. It's the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, uh, which uh, I managed to uh, push through the parliament uh, 
uh, pro proposal tasking the government to make Iceland into safe haven for freedom of information, expression, and speech. Uh, and that's a miracle that we managed to get through, and we're working on the laws um, to make them. We're working on the yeah. So we're actually tasked them to do ten different laws, which they're working on, and. Um, and then I, I would like for you to go and um, uh, look at the current status of your own Freedom of Information Act and uh, uh, laws that deal with um, ownership of media and so forth. And, and just I think it's important. And, and please go and read the Shock Doctrine and know what to, to do in order to um, change the laws for the benefit of the people, because they are now using the, the Shock Doctrine on you. And we we're gonna need to we need gonna need to get in there. But Brigitte, it's been a pleasure having you on. You're an inspiration, and you've done a fantastic job over there in Iceland. I'm putting your your neck on the line to be honest with you, because I know you've done an awful lot. Um, and you have your own family life and everything else that you have to also do. But I know you've done an awful lot for the Icelandic people there, and I just wish we had somebody like you over here. Um, but um, again, thanks again for coming on.